There I go. Okay. My bad. The the internet is being weird. It was there and now it's not. And it's not even on my list of options to to put as the window. And so I don't know. I don't know what's going on here. You guys are seeing my interface. Why is it? Why is it doing this to me? It did this to me like last week, but we were able to figure it out and now this time it's just, it's not even there. I've got my start menu, search pane, networks. Oh my God. Can I add another window on the fly? Let me see if I can add another window on the fly and just, um, deal with this later um, let me see okay now that's my whole screen hold on <laughs> oh You gotta love. Now it's part of my screen. You guys are seeing past the illusion. Make it smaller. Ah! That's too small! <laughs> oh my god. Wait, hold on. If it's showing up there now, can I. Will it show up on the one that it's supposed to show up on, and I can just delete this one? They hate everything. Welcome back to DCAU Book Club, the place where we fuck around. No, it's not showing up on the one that it's supposed to show up on. Hold on, what if I type what if I type it in? No, it's not. Okay. Well. Oh no, and now I'm moving around the wrong one. Well, I'll tell you what, we'll just, um, oh my god. I don't know why this happens to me, oh, but that's okay. Uh, let me just pull it up here. You guys don't need to worry about my bookmarks. And let me get rid of my downloads. Okay, there we go. We'll just do it like this. I, I don't know why. I don't know why this happened. But it, it is what it is. It was literally, like, it, it, it had my internet thing, and then I switched to the standby screen, and then I come back from the standby screen, it's like, nope, your internet is gone. But that's fine. I mean, my internet wasn't even, like, loading at all yesterday, so I'm glad it was Ted and not me. Um... Dan talking about these streams always have problems at the start. Well, you know what? That's true, but James is also true. I have no idea what the story is so far. I haven't watched any of the archive streams. Care to fill me in? Um, yeah, no, so actually there was a guy that like kept talking about pissing on himself. Essentially, um, what has happened is that um, Sinzu is like a master tactician. Um, he kind of like was raised in like the east or whatever and came to find out about batman and planned to take over gotham city to see if batman was truly his equal um so he got himself put into arkham and staged a whole breakout of both arkham and stonegate inmates and he got Scarecrow, Clayface, and Bane to be essentially his generals as, like, they're the main ones that distract Batman while, you know, the the overall pandemonium distracts all of Batman's other, um, other peoples. And while Sinzu gets to scheme around in the background, um, Batman's gone up against Scarecrow so far. We had, um... 
every every chapter is told from like a different character's perspective so like we had alfred's perspective where he was you know he took batman to crime alley to put the roses down um we had Senzu's perspective where he's telling us, you know, all of his plans and stuff. We had Freddie Galen's perspective, who was some random thug who kept talking about pissing himself. Um, we had Jonathan Crane's perspective, the scarecrow. He got his ass beat. Um, we had Robin's perspective um, of, you know, just taking down thugs and trying to meet up with Nightwing. Then we went back to Sinzu, who uh, who gave us like a flashback into his upbringing and everything, and now this time we are on chapter six with Nightwing. We're gonna figure out where is Nightwing. Um, so for for every couple pages, I um, I come through to this spreadsheet over here um, and take notes on uh on like what's going on that way we have that all available for videos that we're making in the future um like who was in the chapter you know what places were in the chapter um cool objects that are mentioned by name you know stuff that might make it non-canon stuff that's like uh directly references like um points of continuity with the show or other um DCAU entries like the comics and whatnot, uh, you know, timeline information, all that kind of stuff. Uh, so I do that every couple pages, um, but we'll hop in right now with uh, Chapter 6, Nightwing slash Dick Grayson at 1.20 a.m. Uh, Nightwing, 2 ints 1! Batman says into the comlink, Two-Face Encounter 1. He's referring to a case from nearly nine years ago that, ex that ended in a rather unforgettable fight on top of the first bank of Gotham building in the Diamond District by Robinson Park. It's his way of telling me he wants a meet when, where no one can hear us. I answer with a simple, Tin Four! and start moving across town trying to think about what the recent Stonegate prison and Arkham Asylum breakouts must be doing to him. Since midnight, Gotham City's been in total chaos. Not just a riot or a gang war, not just a crime spree uptown or downtown, not just a friend being terrorized or a fire or two uh, blazing out of control in residential districts, but all of the above all at once. Um... Do any of y'all know what that Two-Face one um, could be referring to? I, I feel like it's probably a reference directly to an episode, but I can't think of it off the top of my head. Uh, multiple officer down calls on the police wire, sounds of gunfire and glass, break, breaking and alarms blaring, and stolen cars screeching through the streets. The smell of cordite and burning fuel and the sickly chemical residue of Scarecrow's fear gas carried on the frigid wind. You can't spit without hitting a felon. And the real genius of the organization behind this attack is that it isn't organized. Every cri excuse me. Every criminal for himself, all doing whatever their sick minds can think of. It's chaos, a nightmare. The worst Gotham seen in a long, long time. And Gotham City? Well, she's maybe the closest thing Batman has to a lover. He spends every night with her. Um, he spends every night with her, ministers to her tirelessly th when she's sick, buys her presents, cop cars rather than Mercedes, but hey, whatever works. Bad Batman funding the police. In, in a time like this, he can't stand it when she's in pain, and I know how he feels. I can't stand it when he is. Oh, I didn't flip the page. Jacob's saying that it's glitchy. Is it? Is it? Is the audio glitching, or is it just video? I don't... I don't know. God knows he never shows weakness and hardly anything phases him, but he's been my mentor for my entire professional crime fighting life. 
And I know when something gets under his skin. I just know. I met Batman when I was eight. My life can be neatly divided into before Batman and after Batman. I even got a name change, kind of. One minute I'm just Dick Grayson, and the next minute I'm Robin the Boy Wonder. Now I go by Nightwing. That's interesting, because, um... According to Robin's reckoning, he was 9 or 10 when he met Batman. But seeing as this is, you know, from Nightwing's perspective, I feel like maybe, uh, maybe taking him as 8 years old rather than, uh, you know, the credits that don't agree with each other. Saying he's 9 or 10 might be... Might be more, uh, canonically sound, so long as, you know, the book itself holds up. Without Batman, I never would have been able to channel the grief and rage I felt at the loss of my parents. It's hard to even imagine where I'd be now if our paths hadn't crossed. My best guess is jail. Yeah, I'm an orphan too, just like Bruce. Only, my folks weren't rich. Not by a long shot. My parents were John and Mary Grayson, and together, the three of us were the Amazing Flying Graysons, the center ring aerial act for Haley's Circus. The circus was my world. I loved it with every fiber of my being. I remember Dad once telling me that my mom had been training to be a dental assistant before she met and ran away with him. I wrinkled my nose and asked her why anyone would ever want to do anything but work for a circus. She laughed and kissed me on the ear and said she had no idea. I do miss them. Later that same night, a small-time crook named Tony Zuko threatened the livelihood of the circus after Mr. Haley refused to pay him extortion money. Not ten minutes later, I saw Zuko exiting the back of the big top. I knew he didn't belong there, and I tried to point him out to Mom, but it was time for our performance, and no matter what, the show must go on. I was there on the platform, getting ready to fly, when the guy, when the guy wire that holds up the trapeze came apart like a spider web under my father's weight. He just caught Mom by the wrist, and he managed not to scream as the tent floor came rushing up to claim him. Mom did scream, and so did I. I tried to catch them, and when I couldn't, I tried not to watch. I tried not to hear the thud of their bodies as they hit the sawdust, broken and lifeless. Once on the ground, I tried not to step in the still warm blood seeping out from, my father, from the back of my father's skull. I shook my mom, desperate for a flash of recognition from her sightless blue eyes. She didn't recognize me. She was already dead. She would never recognize me again. I can still feel my chest constrict when I think about it. I don't think my body could even hold that much grief at that age. So, instead of grief, I felt rage. Kneeling there, under the unbearably absent shadow of the missing safety net, we never worked with one. That was our hubris. I guess our fault. I raised a fist to the tent top and swore revenge. I'd get Tony Zuko if it was the last thing I ever did. That night, Jim Gordon drove me to Wayne Manor. Jim was the new police commissioner of Gotham City, where we'd been playing uh, when the accident occurred. Since I had boldly told him that I'd seen Zuko and could identify him in a lineup, he insisted on taking me to a safe house. So yeah, so let's uh, let's go ahead and grab some notes out of that. Um, we got mention of Two Face. You know, we've got mention of Batman, but we've had him in other chapters, so I'm not sweating that. Um, Scarecrow, we've got him already. Um, I feel like. What is it? We've got um, the Amazing Flying Graysons. Um, Mr. Haley is mentioned uh, just by proxy of Haley Circus. Um, what are their names? John and Mary Grayson. Okay, yeah. John Grayson. Mary Grayson. 
Tony Zuko. I think those are basically the main ones. We've already got Jim Gordon from other uh, from other things. Let's see. Then we had locations. First Bank of Gotham. Um, Diamond District, Robinson Park. Um, uptown and downtown. Stonegate, Arkham Asylum. I know we got both of those. Um, we've got Gotham City in general. Uh, da, 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 da. I guess Haley Circus is technically a location. It's a it's a mobile location, but it's a location. And then I don't think we've been to Wayne Manor yet. I don't recall, so I'll just put it there just in case. Uh, objects, we had a mention of the Mercedes. Non-canon, okay. Um, so the first thing that hit me was that Two-Face has been active for nine years. Or at least nine years. Um, which doesn't line up with Tim only having been active for one year um, due to other Two-Face timeline clues placing his debut in 1994, right? Because then, then this book should take place in 2003 when it was published, but then we would be like two to th or three to four years into to Tim Drake's career. Um, another thing was, of course, uh, Dick Grayson was eight when he met Bruce. Rather than nine or ten as seen in... Robin's Reckoning credits. I guess... I guess technically he said almost nine years ago. So, I'll turn at least to around... Or at least... I'll, I'll turn it to at least eight years. There we go. That, I think, fits better. Uh, continuity slash in show events. Um, the Robin's Reckoning flashback. Is retold. Um, and then of course that same stuff has to be put into the timeline uh, thing. Let's see. Referring to a case from nearly nine years ago. Would that have been Two Face Part Two if if he's referring to it as Two Face Encounter One? Okay, yeah, I do have a period there. Uh, Dick was eight when. Uh, 
I guess he wasn't technically adopted, was he, when his family died? Uh, and then, let's see. Something else. Other timeline notes. Um, Jim Gordon is new police commissioner during RR flashback. So I think that's... I think that's generally everything from this section so far. So let me go ahead and turn the page. A two-faced battle taking place nine years ago automatically moves this beyond the TNBA years, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it would, it would, it would put us in two thousand three um, at least. Which, um, which would be around the time of, like, Batman and Harley Quinn and, like, the Cadmus arc and all of that. But, like I said, that doesn't really line up with Tim having said that he was only Robin for a year now and is still 13. So, I feel like that, that line alone puts a big old wrench into, into things. Maybe there will be a way to, to figure it out, maybe not. Um, just as a heads up, because um, I know some of you said that you aren't, or that this is your first time here. Um, for some reason, sometimes the live stream likes to, to just crap out on me. So if that does happen, um, just refresh the page. It doesn't mean I'm gone. You will, uh, you will know when I'm gone. I will tell you that I'm leaving. Um, let's see, where was I? Okay, yeah. That night, Jim Gordon drove me to Wayne Manor. Jim was the new police commissioner of Gotham City, where we'd been playing when the accident occurred. Since I had boldly told him that I'd seen Zuko and could identify him in a lineup, he insisted on taking me to a safe house. Safe house. That's actually pretty funny now that I think about it. There's no safer house in all of Gotham. I didn't think it was the least bit funny at the time, though. I didn't want to leave the circus, and I certainly didn't want to leave the circus with a cop. Aside from the truant officers, there's nobody scarier to a circus kid than a policeman. Jim wasn't frightening, though. He had a sort of fatherly look to him, and he spoke to me seriously and kindly, which is a sign of someone who understands kids. I remember something he said to me in the circular gravel driveway in front of Wayne Manor. We'd just gotten out of the car, and he stopped to put a hand on my shoulder. Be brave, son, he said. For a second, I wished I was staying with him. And then he rang the doorbell. As the giant front door swung open, I found myself looking up into the perfectly composed face of an older gentleman whose eyes were half closed as he politely greeted the commissioner in a soft British accent, and then he glanced down at me. I remember that he bent down to my height and smiled very gently, and you must be Master Richard, he said. Dick, I insisted. It's what my dad called me. He nodded seriously. Master Dick, then. He said without a hint of condescension. He straightened up and motioned for us both to enter. I am Alfred. Do please come in. If it had been any other day, I would have been knocked out by the size of the place alone. Until that night, I'd slept in a trailer with my parents. Now I found myself entering a living room, easily the size of eight trailers, with a fire roaring in a fireplace that was literally as big as a Mack truck. I remember thinking that if worse came to worst, I could probably get up to one of the chandeliers, snag a crystal droplet, and pawn it to live comfortably for the rest of my short life. I did notice Bruce, though. There's no way I couldn't have. Within moments of my entry into the living room, he appeared and he knelt in front of me, placing both hands on my shoulders and steadily watching my face until I finally met his eyes. Even with one knee on the floor like that, he was huge. His hands on my shoulders were massive and warm. I lost my parents too, Dick, he said, the very first words he spoke to me. I won't say I know how you feel, but if you ever want to tell me, I'm relatively certain I would understand. 
Alfred ushered me away for dinner, and I started to comprehend how far I'd really traveled. We, we were less than 20 minutes away from the fairgrounds in Newton, but this was a whole different world. Over time, Alfred became like a parent to me. He taught me how to play chess, how to cook, how to recite Shakespeare, how to repair cars. He played opera for me and laughed at every single one of my stupid jokes and sat with me by my bed all night when I couldn't sleep for the nightmares. And Bruce, well, obviously in many ways, he became a father to me. He's so different than my dad was. I mean, if you asked John Grayson where babies came from, he'd laugh and say, beer bottles. You ask Bruce Wayne, and you get a humorless two-hour lecture on reproductive biology. My dad didn't take anything seriously but flying. And Bruce, well, the only thing he doesn't take seriously is me. And I mean that in a good way. I mean, I could sometimes make him loosen up a little, but it takes serious effort. Um... So let's see. So we got a mention of Mack Truck. Uh, oh. What is going on? There it is. Um, Newton Fairgrounds were mentioned. And then we got a mention of, um, what was his name? William Shakespeare. I'm sure I'm spelling it wrong, but Shakespeare didn't even know how to spell his own name. That's a historical fact. So maybe what everyone's agreed on is wrong. Um... I don't mind, though. Part of my job. In those first few days at the manor, however, as kind as they were, neither Alfred nor Bruce made much of an impression on me. I was obsessed with Tony Zuko. No matter how nice the smart rich guy and his thoughtful butler were, it didn't do a thing to cure me of the notion that the man who murdered my parents had to die. The only person or thing with enough power to break through that obsession was Batman. I still remember the first time I saw him. I had run away from Wayne Manor to go after Zuko. Finding him was harder than I thought. I stole a picture from the PD and fearlessly canvassed the wrong side of town. I had made it all the way out to Burnley when I absolutely and totally lucked into his location. Only my luck quickly topped out when, tiptoeing to a phone booth to call Commissioner Gordon, I stepped on a soda can. Next thing I knew, I was standing outside in the dark by the rushing waters of the Sprang River, with a grown man's hand around my throat, less than two minutes away from being killed by the murderer of my own parents. Zuko had been packing to leave town and was terrifically pleased to have the, his only material witness show up at his hideout, weaponless and without much of a plan. And then suddenly I heard Zuko grunt, hit by a batarang. I later came to realize, and his grip on me slackened. Oh, hit by a batarang I later came to realize. Got it. I, I hate when like I'm reading something and I, I give it the incorrect inflection. The Grayson parents actually getting a bit of characterization for once. I like it. Yeah, for sure. Um, and his grip on me slackened. I knew someone else was there with us, but I didn't care. I had Zuko in my sights, and I was going to beat him to death with my eight-year-old fists. Come hell or high water. I moved as fast as I could, kicking at his shins and hurtling my fists into his ribs again and again until I finally hurt him enough to annoy him. Hollering at me, infuriated, he tossed me away towards a weak railing, a, a weak railing that overhung the Sprang River. And that's when I saw Batman. He was over six feet tall and almost completely concealed by a dark, swirling cape. His mask was like a demon's terrifying eyes, narrow and glinting white in the dark. Sharp pointy ears rose from his head or from his covered head and only his jaw remained exposed, an afterthought of bristly human flesh that was really no less intimidating. A black bat was emblazoned across the impenetrable armor of his chest, his gloved hands and fists, booted feet planted solidly in the earth. He was awesome. I knew immediately that he was real. 
The most serious, dangerous, effective, real thing I'd ever seen. <coughs> I should have been petrified, but instead, a feeling of intense calm came over me. There was no question in my mind that this creature would destroy Tony Izuko. Maybe he'd kill me too, but that was fine. He was my own personal dark angel come to answer my dearest wish, the avenging of my parents' murders. A second before I hit the cold water of the river, Batman called my name in a voice so rough and dark that it could not possibly have existed in the daylight. It didn't seem strange to me that he knew who I was. After all, I'd conjured him. I sank under the icy water almost blissfully. I think I would have drowned peacefully right then except for the images of my mother's face floating into my soaking consciousness so vividly that it knocked the little bit of air remaining out of my lungs. Where Batman's face had filled me with tranquility and acceptance, my mother's filled me with grief and negotiation. I couldn't die. It would break her heart. Suddenly, I needed to live. I began to panic in the water, to flounder and kick and cry out for help. So we got a mention of Burnley, um, Spring River, Tony Zuko's hideout. Just a lot more locations to add. I'm sure some of these have already come up. But that's okay. I can always... go back and remove notes more easily than I can add them in after the fact. Let's flip the page. But yeah, I definitely, I'm definitely enjoying like how thorough they're being in um, telling backstories and stuff. We're getting like a lot of extra characterization that we like never got um, in the shows or, you know, even in the tie-in comics and stuff. Um, it kind of, it kind of like, on the one hand though, it's like we're kind of retreading old ground, um, you know, going back to that stuff, uh, rather than, you know, staying in the present with like what's going on in Gotham City, uh, what's going on with Sinzu. But I, I am enjoying, like, getting to know more about the Grayson family, how we got to learn more about, like, Alfred's um, upbringing a couple chapters back. Um, and, you know, getting the... The backstory on Sin Tzu, I think, is probably one of the more interesting aspects, specifically because, like, you know, he was created for this story. So it's interesting to, to like, learn about him more so than, like, just what the video game tells you of like, oh, he's, you know, he's a warlord. And then all at once, there was something solid, something that didn't yield, that grabbed me and hauled me back into the air with savage force. With my back against his chest and his arm around me holding my head up out of the water, Batman felt like hope. Not that I was appreciative, mind you. Once Batman had me safely back on land, I looked around expectantly for Tony Zuko's corpse and realized with a slow, dawning horror that my dark angel had messed up. He'd let Zuko go and saved me instead. I was furious. You let him go, I shouted and began pounding the bat on his chest plate with my fist. Why'd you do it? Why? Why? I, I meant, why did you let Zuko go? But I also meant, why did you bother saving me? I'm looking forward to the next chapter. The villains are my favorites. Oh, for sure. Yeah, next chapter we get Clayface. So that's going to be a fun one. Especially if they keep going on with the backstory stuff. Like, um, you know, there, there's... It's been confirmed that, like, uh, part of his backstory with, like, Teddy... Uh, in Batman the Animated Series was that uh, Teddy, his assistant, uh, was actually uh, his lover. So I'd be really interested to see if this book um, dives into their relationship at all, especially with the fact that like it's touching on a bit more mature themes. Like we've got um, we, 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 we've got mention of you know alcohol or like actual cursing or the Aryan Brotherhood or everything like that so it seems like they wouldn't shy away from touching on the lgbt stuff there 
Um, but it's also possible that, like, they didn't pick up on the subtext. So, I guess we'll see when we get to that. The fountain of anguish inside of me, held in cheek until then by dreams of revenge, now threatened to well up and overflow. My mother was gone, and it was my fault, really. Didn't Batman understand that? Because I'd seen Zuko leave the tent, and I didn't stop the show. I didn't do enough to save her. I didn't save my dad. And now Zuko had escaped. My body was shaking with violence, and I hit the bat chest plate over and over again as hard as I could. Even so, even though I hit Batman with all the force my sopping, wet body could muster, he remained solid and unyielding. When he did finally move, it was to put a large gloved hand against the back of my head, almost tenderly, almost like my dad would have done. I came undone, falling up against his chest plate, sobbing. I was sure, somehow, that he understood and could withstand my streaming grief. And he did. He let me cry for what felt like hours, saying nothing, sturdy and still. And when I finally started to catch my breath in long, jagged gulps, a deafening whirring sound filled the sky. I looked up through tear-stained eyes to see a giant metallic bat hovering above us, clearly at his command. It was with the one exception of Batman himself, the coolest frickin' thing I had ever seen. Where are we going? I asked him with the casual ease of a lost soul. It didn't occur to me for one minute that he wouldn't take me with him. Wherever he was going, I was going. Home, he said gruffly. I remember wondering if we were going to heaven or to hell. Instead, we went to the Batcave, which is a little bit of both. And then Batman did the weirdest thing I'd ever seen. He pulled his cowl back and transformed into my host, Bruce Wayne. I don't think it would surprise him now to know that my first thought was a wish that he'd put the mask back on. My relationship has always been more with Batman than with Bruce. Of course, that's partly because Batman is more real than Bruce. Batman is what happened to the orphaned Bruce Wayne soul. Batman is the answer and the choice and the holy mission. Bruce Wayne, well, he's the disguise that makes it possible to move around in the light of day. I'm not like that. Hardly anyone else I know is like that. I put on the Nightwing mask so that no one notices it's really Dick Grayson who's kicking their butt. That's the way it usually works among us capes, but not with Batman. He's the real thing. And I still don't know what made him take me in. At that moment in time, in the dark of that cave under Wayne Manor, still soaking wet and lost and clearly too small to be of any actual use to him, I became the only person in the whole world besides Alfred who knew this secret. And let me tell you, not that I don't appreciate the trust fund and the education and the endless training he's bestowed upon me over the years, but nothing anyone has ever given me or ever will could be more valuable to me than his confidence that night. Let me flip the page. It's interesting that he mentions um, capes. You know, because it makes me wonder, like, who else is active around this time? Like, I mean, depending on, you know, where we place the book, if if it were a year after Tim joined uh, the Bat family, and then that was, you know, what, 2000, 2001-ish? Um, or if it was nine years after Two-Face in 2003, it drastically changes the, uh, the answer to that Uh and P. Yes, there's lots of P. Um, I find it really telling that Matt Hagen's lover was his body double. Sorry, I just got back. Howdy, Matty. Hope you're good. I am doing good. John Stewart, elongated man too. Yeah, I mean, like, John Stewart would definitely be uh, would definitely be active um, around this time. Um, but like, he'd be off world, so I don't know that anyone would really know of him. I'm thinking like. Um, I'm thinking, you know, we've got Static, um, the Bat Family, um, Superman, Supergirl, uh, and then we would have, I guess, Kyle Rayner, uh, the Demon, Creeper, Doctor Fate, Steel, uh, Flash, 
But, like, I'm wondering, like, which ones of these Nightwing would have, like, interacted with to know, like, why it is that they wear a mask. Because we don't really... I don't think we've gotten any, like, um... Any on-screen stuff of, uh, of his... Hawk Girl, maybe? Yeah, Hawk Girl... Hawk Girl would have come around during the Lost Years. So, yeah, she would definitely... But, like... She doesn't wear a mask for the reason that Nightwing says most of them wear a mask. Since Ralph's confirmed to have been active since before Wally became active. Is he? I don't, I don't remember that, but you, you were probably right. I just, uh, I just don't specifically remember that, uh, that being mentioned. Um, but yeah, let's, let's hop back to it. Batman changed the entire trajectory of my life. With the utterance of one simple vow, I swear that I will fight against crime and corruption and never swerve from the path of justice. I went from being one of life's many casualties to being the luckiest kid in the world. Oh yeah, Z Zatanna would have been around as well, but like I don't know, I don't know that she would have been um, recognized for actual magic yet, right? Because like we see her as a stage magician doing like just trickery kind of stuff and then all of a sudden like years later in justice league she is like in tune with actual magic so i don't know i don't know what her trajectory is there Yeah, I became Robin, the boy wonder. I became Bruce's ward and Batman's sidekick. I trained beside him, fought beside him, shared all the hazards of the dark as night after night went um hold on. Shared all the hazards of the dark as night after night we went out together to stop crime in the streets of Gotham City. Sometimes we'd break up drug rings or stop a burglary in progress. Other times, we'd battle against the costume freaks like Joker and Two-Face, who began to line up to get a shot at us. Together, years later, we even took down Tony Zuko. And by that time, as much as I adored and missed them, I didn't need my parents back. I was completely in love with my new life. Not that Batman doesn't drive me crazy. Have you ever broken a house rule and waited with trepidation for Dad to show up and dole out the punishment? Well, now imagine that your dad's Batman, and that's just a start. He's moody and hyper-disciplined and unforgiving, and he could push my buttons like no one else on the planet. Sometimes I'm convinced that he's determined to eradicate all of my self-confidence. Sometimes I can't believe how cold and distant he can be, even with his tiny handful of confidants like me. Sometimes he gets me so worked up, I catch myself screaming at him like the hot-headed scrapper he sometimes accuses me of being. And then I remember that a tremendous honor in it all is... Er, and then I remember what a tremendous honor in it all is. I realize that he pushes me because if he doesn't, I might die. He's distant because if he's not... He's going to miss something, and then someone somewhere else will die. Everything in his world really is a matter of life and death, and he never forgets that, even if I sometimes do. There was one fight, less than a year ago now, when I stopped dead in the middle of yelling at him about not including me in a particular decision-making process. I, th I think, but even I can't always keep track of these things. To laugh. What's so funny, he asked. Uh, What's so funny, he asked, his voice dark and irritated. I can't believe I'm yelling at Batman. I grinned and was gratified to see his posture soften. You've earned the right, he said quietly, turning away. That's pretty good for him these days. When I was younger and snottier, I could sometimes even make him laugh. Throughout everything, he's remained the coolest person I've ever met. I die for him without hesitation, and I hope he knows that. Of course, he'd be too busy preparing to die to save me to take me up on the offer. That's just the kind of guy he is. So when he calls me in, like he did tonight, I'm there. It takes me longer than the normal four minutes to get from my location to his. The city is buzzing like an all-night carnival. There's trouble everywhere you look. I have to stop three times, once to interrupt an in-progress burglary at the Gotham Gym Exchange before tracking down the morons selling guns 
out of the back of his van to guys still wearing penitentiary jumpsuits, wants to de-escalate a turf war between the Escobedo cartel and a handful of Stonegate convicts who seem to feel they'd been sold out in the last big shakedown, and wants, with grim pleasure, to stop a two or a two twenty in progress. Okay, so we got um. I don't know that this is um, a reference to anything we've seen. Uh, less than a year ago, Dick laughs at Batman while they are arguing. Um, we just got a mention of the Escobedo cartel. And then we got, what was it? Gotham Gym Exchange. So there's a couple things. I'm thinking like in the back of my head, I wanna, I wanna, um, like, cause he says that like the encounter uh, with with Two Face was nearly nine years ago, and I guess like technically, if you uh, if you cut it in half, uh, to be like four and a half years ago, you're you're fifty percent of the way there, so it's nearly nine years, right? Like like I want this, I want this book to work. Um, Since Dick mentions that most, not all heroes that he know of who isn't Batman is their secret identity, not their superhero persona, whereas Hot Girl is more her superhero persona, I think. Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, let's see. Why Batman is mean and not very caring is because Bruce doesn't want to lose anyone else, so he keeps everybody... Yes. Yes, I think we're in agreement there. Um... Let's figure out what this 220 in progress means. Uh, and once with grim pleasure to stop a 220 in progress. I heard the woman scream and saw a flash of orange in the alley behind the sewer complex. I knew I had to get to the meet with Batman, but unlike the parked car thefts and petty acts of vandalism, I let slide for the time being. There was no way I could pass by this one. I slid halfway down an ornate drain pipe and dropped the rest of the way to the sidewalk, landing beside Mike Hardcore Connolly. He got his, the nickname Hardcore in Stonegate, a derisive joke about his compulsive need to lie about his supposedly extensive bedpost notching. I landed with an unmistakable thud. I wanted him to know I was there. Next, I kicked his knee in from behind while simultaneously grabbing the wrist of his right hand. He went down on his knees in front of his would-be victim with a grunt while I twisted his arms painfully behind his back in a straightforward jiu-jitsu lock Batman taught me when I was 12. Batman said it was good for fast takedowns, and he was right. Works every time. Want to kick him? I said to the woman who was crying and scared and trying to hold her ripped blouse together. She looked at me, startled and then back down to hardcore, and then to my great satisfaction, she snapped a sweet straight kick right into his chin. Hardcore let out a torrent of curses and I stepped on the back of his ankles as she struggled to get up. Shut up, I growled at him, sliding my right boot up to, the, to place painful pressure on the back of his prone calf. Then I looked back up at the woman and nodded to her. I'll hold him as long as you'd like me to, ma'am. She didn't hesitate. The, words, the world tries to rob you of your sense of action, and for those of us who don't have Batman's patience for planning and preparation, sometimes it really does help to kick and scream a little. Besides, it was about time this loser got the notion that women weren't easy prey. I only hope he runs into some of the women I know sometime later tonight. So is a 220, is that like a, a rape case? Is that is that police code for that? Because that's the, 
that's the notion that I'm getting uh, out of this. 220 in progress. Let me Google that. Uh, maybe 220 police code. In Seattle Police Department, it's mental complaint. 220 New York Police Code. Looks like in New York, it's an auto hit and run. Maybe, maybe it's changed over the years, but it seems to be... Yeah, it seems to be an attempted rape is what I'm getting. Talking about women being easy prey, talking about her, her blouse being ripped, talking about how um, Mike Connolly um, got his nickname specifically from bedpost notching. That's, uh, that's, that's my assumption. Understandably, the civilian didn't want to get near Mike with her hands, but she kicked him three more times. One snap kick to the throat, a beautiful roundhouse to his left shoulder, and finally a fierce, if unsteady, side kick aimed towards his chest. By the third kick, she wasn't crying anymore, just breathing hard. Her small hands balled into fists, her dark hair falling out of her ponytail in wavy wisps. This was one woman who now knew she could fight back. Do you live nearby? I asked quietly. She nodded, cheeks flushed. Hardcore was still on his knees, though now he was moaning more than cursing. Hold on, I told her. I'll walk you. She wiped the tears off her face with her palms, wincing when she touched the nasty bruise Hardcore had left on her cheek. Lousy creep. I grabbed a discarded plastic six-pack holder off the ground and used it to tie Hardcore to the bottom of the drain pipe, still on his knees. Then I backhanded him, maybe a little harder than I needed to. He went out. I turned towards the woman as gallantly as I could, trying to show her what I, that I wasn't a threat. I wished I wore a cape so that I could drape it over her. Batman draped a cape over me once, when I was about 14, and lost with him in the snow of Cat Katmandu, and I have never felt so safe. So it's interesting that we're getting more, um, more stuff about, uh, Dick's past. Um, let's see, real quick, we got, um, what, Mike Hardcore Connolly. Uh, do they, do they name the victim... They haven't yet. So if they do, I'll just save it for the next. Mike Hardcore. Connolly. Then we got mention of the Soar Complex. I assume is an apartment complex. And then we got Katmandu. Um, Bruce taught Dick Jiu-Jitsu at the age of 12. Uh, and... Dick and Bruce went to Kathmandu when he was 14. Batman and Harley Quinn 220 Cannon. Oof. That's a oof. Uh, comics, comics. Uh, but no, I dropped the cape when I dropped the Robin costume. Thought it was too restricting for a former Flying Grayson. Now I wear neck-to-toe Kevlar in black. 
with a large blue bird pattern over my chest to draw punches towards the armor's apex. Another lesson Batman taught me early. You don't think that Big Bat is there just for show, do you? Slap a small black mask over my eyes, mess up my hair a little, and presto changeo, mysterious vigilante. So I merely gestured to her to go ahead and then walk beside her for a block and a half until she turned and ran up the steps of a modest brownstone. She unlocked the heavy front door and then turned with a slight smile and waved at me. Thanks! She squeaked before stepping into the well-lit entranceway and closing the door behind her. Anytime, I told the door. There's nothing like a woman smiling in your direction to tell you you've done good. But don't let me even start thinking about women. It's already taking a full half of my concentration not to check every shadow for a bright yellow bat and a flame of red hair. Batman City is bleeding from every orifice, and all I can think is, Woohoo! A bona fide emergency! Maybe Batgirl will come out to help! Priorities, Grayson. Priorities. It was a shift in priorities that made me finally give up being Robin. It was a difficult decision, actually, but I think I did the right thing. After college, I left Gotham to travel, like Bruce did when he was at that age. I studied a whole bunch of different martial arts and crime fighting techniques and thought about what it would mean to go back to Gotham and put those tights back on. And I knew it meant that I'd forever live in Batman's shadow, that I would become pre predictable to him. I couldn't let that happen. It's my job as a surrogate son to grow out from under that shadow, and my job as a partner to keep him on his toes. Besides, this way, as Nightwing, I get to come to him on my own terms. Batman is still waiting on the rooftop of the bank by the time I get to the Diamond District. He's crouching next to one of the hulking stone gargoyles, his heavy cape stirring slightly in the wind. Below him, Gotham spreads out in an unceasing scene of pandemonium. I can tell... Uh, where'd I go? I can tell by the way he's watching the street that he's been up and down the building's edge a dozen times already, stopping every crime that passes beneath him. Oh, take it easy, Adam. Good having you around. It's very unfortunate that Bruce and Dick fell out over the years in DCAU. Yeah, I mean, it, it makes good stories, though. Um, let's see, where was I? I watch him for a moment from the top of the building across the street, marveling at his complete stillness. I personally am not, truth be told, all that great at holding still. I mean, I can do it when it needs to be done, but I hate it. It feels entirely unnatural to me, but Batman can remain motionless for hours, unless he feels eyes on him. I've been watching him for less than two seconds when his cowled face tilts up towards me. Eyes narrow. I smile and offer a friendly two-finger salute, and then I get the hell across the street as fast as my grapnel line will carry me. Sorry to keep you waiting. I'm apologizing before my boots even touch down on the rooftop. Crazy night out there. You okay? Batman straightens and turns towards me. His expression is completely impassive as usual. But I can sense his distress and his anger. Something about the way he holds his jaw, maybe. Or possibly by now just a sixth sense I've developed. Let me flip the page. I just want to know what they were doing in Kathmandu now, right? Like you can't, you can't bring up there was a case in Kathmandu, and do all of this. Uh, I'm stretching a little bit. Do all of this like you know, backstory and exposition of stuff that we have seen, and then make something up, and not ex not explain and explore on that. What were they doing in Kathmandu? I already knew about Tony Zuko. <laughs> What I know for sure is that whoever's behind all of this is going to be very, very sorry when they finally find themselves face to face with Gotham's Dark Knight. Are you aware that our enemy may have one of our communicators? That's Batman's way of saying hello. I nod. Yeah, I heard that rumor. Spoke with Robin a little while ago. He said Alfred lost it, his in a scrap. That's the other thing about deciding to be Nightwing. Batman went out and got another Robin. 
If I'd known it'd be that easy to get more people watching Batman's back, I would have given up on the outfit years ago. Batman looks back over the city. Continue to use the frequencies for everything but deployment orders and acknowledgements. You sure? We could just turn them off if they're compromised. No. Our opponent is relaxed and comfortable right now. Thinks he's got a one up on me. Let him keep thinking that. So this one's personal. I don't think so. Not a rematch in any event. I'm not completely sure who we're dealing with yet. But I have a few theories. None of them bode well. I nod. This doesn't look like your average skull to me, either. As chaotic as this seems, Batman continues, it is organized. Highly organized, actually. The Stonegate and Arkham releases, as well as Scarecrow's attack on Jim, were too well-timed to be coincidence. The individual behind this is very aware of my presence in this city, and he wants me at, that, at a disadvantage. Well, that, I think, just makes him smart. Woe to the bad guy who takes on Batman head-on. I'm beginning to think the breakout at Stonegate is just a distraction. A tactic, rather, to exhaust my resources. I nod again, listening. I love trying to follow the way his mind works. How he puts things together. I'm still learning from him all the time. It also pleases me that he trusts me enough to use me as a sounding board. He continues... This man we're up against, he has a military background of some kind, not as a soldier, though this man's a strategist. Robin once joked that he couldn't understand why anyone would be stupid enough to commit a crime in Gotham, knowing that Batman might come for them. I agree with the sentiment completely, but the truth is that Batman attracts the worst of the bad. They all want to go up against him, to be the one who takes him down. Sometimes it's egomania, and sometimes it's a need for quick street cred. But the crazier they are, the hungrier they seem to be to take their chances with the bat. Some of them, like Joker, are even so obsessed with Batman that most of their crimes are directed at him the way the rest of us would send a social invitation. What about Arkham? I ask, thinking it through. Another tactical distraction? Batman's quiet for a moment. No. He says finally, there's something else going on at Arkham. Something more complex. He's almost talking to himself, and I'm beginning to wonder if I should make myself scarce when he suddenly turns to me with an energy I haven't felt coming off of him in years. He's confessional, worried. He flashes a gloved palm at me in an unconscious gesture of trust before balling his whole hand into a fist again. What am I saying? Knowing he does, or nothing he does is unconscious. He's letting me know that he really needs my help. Jim isn't being straight with me. It's hard for him to say. He has a tremendous amount of respect for Commissioner Gordon. In their own weird way, they're best friends. You think he's still under Scarecrow's influence? Batman shakes his head. I dosed him with anti-fear serum. But he's deliberately holding something back. I don't know why he'd do that. Unless... Unless he were protecting somebody! My heart rate accelerates by an easy 30%. Where is Jim's daughter, Barbara? She of the red... She of the red hair and yellow bat on her costume. Maybe the scarecrow took her, too. Maybe somebody's holding her ransom and Jim's afraid to ask Batman for help. Maybe she... Or, unless he's prohibited to say anything by law, Batman interjects. You don't think maybe Barbara's? She's fine. He interrupts with such confidence that I wonder if he hasn't already been by her place to check on her. I feel foolish. Suddenly, and, er, I feel foolish suddenly, and regain control of my breathing. I'm sure Batman's noticed my little panic attack, but he politely fails to mention it. Babs would be annoyed with me for it too. It's not like she's the damsel in distress type. I don't usually worry about her at all. But this night is starting to get under my skin too. 
and we both turn our attention back to the city below us. It seems like things are getting worse by the minute. Together, we notice the storefront go up in flames to our right and hear gunshots from the left. You want me to swing by Arkham and check it out? I volunteer. Did you secure Stonegate? He asks. I nod. Most of the guards are okay. I guess the idea was to get the convicts out on the street as quickly as possible, with no one stopping for grudge rematches or for grudge matches. I have another mission for you. Recon that I think might help me isolate. He's interrupted by a hail from his communicator, the same one we both know the baddie has a bead on. We exchange glances, and I step back into the shadows as he opens the channel. Batman! Comes Commissioner Gordon's voice. Clayface has taken over the chi Gotham chemical plant! Neither Scarecrow nor Clayface could do this alone, Batman tells the commissioner leadingly. There's someone else behind all this. He lets his sentence trail off, giving Jim plenty of room to maneuver. When he answers, Jim's voice is tight. Batman's right. He is hiding something. You better hurry, Batman, is all he says. I step forward, just enough to remind Batman that I'm there. I know it's stupid, but I hate the idea of him feeling alone or betrayed. I fight off an internal wave of anger aimed in Jim's general direction. After everything Batman's done for you, you can't even come clean with him now? What the hell are you hiding? Jim! Is there something you're not telling me? Batman's voice isn't angry. He knows there's a logical explanation behind Jim's actions and is patient enough to let it play out. Still, I can hear the worry in his voice when no answer comes. Jim! Jim? He's quiet another moment and then clicks the communicator off and turns back to me. All emotion has been erased from his face and I realize it won't come back until this is over. We're down to brass tacks now. I can feel it. Batman will not quit until this new enemy is behind bars, or at least lying unconscious and handcuffed at his feet. Okay, so we've got mentions of um, Barbara Gordon slash Batgirl. We've already got Commissioner Gordon from earlier, as I've said. Um, Clayface is mentioned here, but he shows up later, so I'll just write him down. And then we had the Gotham Chemical Plant. Was mentioned. I don't think Nightwing is in the cut scene uh, when Gordon tells Batman about Clayface. So it's funny he says he steps forward to ri remind Batman he's there and to remind the cameraman. Yeah, it's been a while since I've watched the cutscene, so I'm not entirely sure, but that would make sense. Uh, that he's not there. Ugh. Ugh, I'm tired. But we're almost done with this. We got, what, one, two, two and a half pages left. His strategies are incredibly intricate, and his skill is inhuman, but the rules Batman works and lives by are simple. They're practically maxims of battle. Never take sacrifice, fail to aid, or in any way endanger another human life. Never give up on a friend, ally, mission, case, or worthy cause. Never go into battle without careful planning or hesitate to extract yourself from battle if additional planning is needed. Never tell anyone you love them. They might die. The last one is an add-on from his eight-year-old self, and one of which I doubt he's consciously aware. But one th through three makes mighty good sense to me, and I've followed them along with him faithfully. I want you to locate the recent cl clinical files of a man named Gareth Baxter, he says. It won't be easy. He's a federal agent. As soon as you get a beat on him, you'll understand what information I need. He pauses to gauge my reaction to this cryptic command. I meet his eyes calmly. He'll get no arguments from me tonight. If he doesn't yet want me aware of the con contents of Baxter's files, there's a reason. I'll figure it out as I go alone. 
Tell Robin to continue patrolling the city in the east to west sweeps. He continues, satisfied by my lack of protest. He can go light on the city hall district. I'll tell Gordon to continue concentrating police forces there. I start to speak, but Batman is already way ahead of me. I know that's a lot of territory for Robin to cover alone, but I need you to target... I need you on target specific offenses to secure critical intel while I address specialized high-level threats like Scarecrow and Clayface. He pauses again to make sure I'm still fully on board. I've been known to get creative at times. I square my shoulders and hold his gaze, silently promising him that I'll toe the line. If anything in my countenance tells him I'm playing wild card tonight, he'll simply walk away from me. He knows his troops better than we know ourselves. I'm therefore gratified when he continues. Alfred is on humanitarian assistance at Dr. Tompkins' clinic and can be utilized as a drop point for victims in need of aid or shelter. That's the best force structure we can manage at the moment. But I want you to leave your channel open for reassignment. I nod. He surprises me by taking the time to place a hand on my shoulder. The information I'm sending you after is crucial. Keep me informed of your progress. Back up Tim if he needs it. And choose your battles. Our objective is to neutralize from the top down. You can count on me, Batman. I say freaked out for the second time tonight. Freaked out because he used Robin's civilian name. Which means he's worried about us. And because he specifically mentioned a victim drop point. Which means he's expecting prolonged multiple ca casualties. He squeezes my shoulder and my doubts dissipate. He's got it under control. From this point on, it's just a matter of following his orders and watching for the end game. He releases my shoulder, turns, fires his grapnel, and shoots off into the night in one flowing movement. He's off to get Clayface and then make an offensive on whomever it is who's behind all of this. Hopefully, with the assistance of Intel, I'll feed him. Batman won't play catch-up forever. I look forward to him turning the tables. I turn north to head for the Batcave, the best place to start my search, diving off the rooftop of the bank into the cold night air. I cast my line from midway between the sky and the ground and move with the great purpose through Gotham City. Batman City, no matter what this mystery opponent might think. And that's the end of Chapter 6. Um, one last note to add is Gareth Baxter. Oops, I accidentally opened files. I don't need those. I wonder if this Gareth Baxter person is someone that we, like, have any idea who they are based on... Uh, like maybe comic appearances or anything. Let me look him up. Gareth uh, Baxter. Uh, he's a Google Scholar. Uh, it's Gareth Baxter DC Comics. Um, let's see. No, that's not right. First thing that showed up was Guardian, but it, it it's because, like, Baxter Building shows up on that page. So, I don't know that... I don't know that there's actually any, um... Oh, what's going on? I don't know that there's any, uh, actual connection to anything that existed. I am curious... Um, because we got that, that thing with, what, Two-Face and it was the first Bank of Gotham, I think is what was. Let me see if I can find the page again. I think it was the first page of the chapter. I do want to see if I can figure out specifically what that was about. Let's see. Two-Face Encounter 1, he's referring to a case from nearly nine years ago that ended in a rather unforgettable fight on top of the first bank of Gotham building in the Diamond District by Robinson Park. Uh, Two-Face 
First Bank of Gotham, DCAU. Put First Bank of Gotham in quotes. Uh, just a 4chan image board. There's a robbery at the and uh in the Tapatok forum. So yeah, it looks like that might have been something that they completely made up. Oh, is that the map of Gotham in uh? Yeah, so it looks like that's something they made up completely. Yeah, 4chan's kind of, you know... I used to spend a lot of time on there as a teenager, and I'm glad I grew out of it. Because, like, ugh. What a hellhole that is. But yeah, okay, so that's, um... That's chapter 6 of Batman Rise of Sinzu. Um, you know, join us next Thursday for, uh, Chapter 7, where we'll, you know, go into Matt Hagen slash Clayface. Um, we got, we got, a we got a video coming up on, I think it's this Sunday, um, where our story picks back up in a, in a way that we weren't really prepared to do, but had to force in because of coronavirus if we wanted to do any story at all so that's gonna be fun um you know we had our our batman the adventures continues um breakdown came out yesterday uh if you guys haven't seen that yet and of course um on top of all that uh, if you have seen it already, you know that we're all uh, that we're you know committed to donate a percentage of this month's uh, revenue to um, reclaim the block, uh, which is a charity that you know deals with tr trying to move funds in policing in Minneapolis specifically uh, from policing towards uh, you know better social programs uh, that actually help the community. Um, you know, because the, there's the whole conversation going on about, like, defunding the police. And a large part of that is, like, moving, like, their responsibility for, like, dealing with, like, mental illness or, or drug-related crimes to agencies that, um, you know, are, are more, like, are better equipped to deal with that kind of thing rather than treating um, those people like they're you know criminals um so on top of the base percentage that we uh that we are already donating to reclaim the block um we've decided as of yesterday that if you if um if you watch you know our black heroes matter um i'll, I'll drop the link in chat uh this was our this was our video uh from march last year um that we decided to you know We've been wanting to share, but like didn't want it to be opportunistic, and so we decided that at least for this month, if not indefinitely, um, proceeds from you know everything, 100% of the revenue from this specific video will be going to reclaim the block. Um, so if you want to, you know, if you don't have money to donate yourself, if you want to help out, uh, you, you watch that video, share it around, you know. Every little bit helps. Um, but with that said, I am planning to go back out and join the protests again today. Um, I'm sure a lot of you guys have seen about Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone. It's been a really interesting. Um, it's been a really interesting project uh, that I have been in and out of. Um, I, I I I feel like I haven't really spent enough time there to to 100% like give any. Um, any feedback on like the organization of it or anything like that but so far from my experience it's been a really positive environment um it's been uh you know community has really been coming together on all of that and, and there's been food out there every day um 
people are trying to supply the area with um, tents and sleeping bags and stuff um, for for so that there are people you know out there twenty four seven to to kind of you know keep an eye on things. Uh, but yeah, it's been it's been pretty awesome. Um, so we'll probably be heading back down to check in on that uh, shortly. So I'm going to hop out. Uh, imagine seeing someone having a mental breakdown and immediately thinking, you know who will be good at handling this? The guy with a giant gun and an itchy trigger. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. It, it's um, like, I, I don't I don't know why that falls under, you know, the, 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 the aspect of policing at all. Um, I, I feel like, if we are to live in a society that, um, you know, still includes police, that um, they should probably mostly only be um, responders to violent crime, you know, because we, we have the, these, these guys constantly showing up to stuff that's not even reported to be violent crimes and saying that they they scare that they're afraid for their life and then all of a sudden someone ends up dead that shouldn't be um but you know it is this is the america that we're living in right now uh and i'm glad that you know the people seem to be saying that they're they're kind of done with that uh but yeah so i'm about to you know hop out go join in on the protest see what's going on um so you guys Take care, and I will see you next week and or on Sunday when uh, you see the next video and or in the Discord. I love y'all bunches. Have a good day.